Hi, and welcome to Answers News for July 10th. Sorry, we're a little bit late today, having some technical difficulties. Um, but I am so excited today, and also for Thursday, to have Dr. Danny Faulkner, our astronomer here at Answers in Genesis, to talk to us about the question that's been on all of our minds, is the Earth flat? Now, you might be thinking, why, are, why do we have to have a Answers News on this topic? Okay, that's kind of the question that I would have asked probably several years ago, like, of course, everyone knows the Earth is not flat. Um, but even recently, when I was at a conference speaking, a woman came up to me afterwards, and she was in tears. And she said to me, um, my husband and my sister-in-law believe that the Earth is flat. Um, how can I help them? What are some resources? And I was kind of just standing there dumbfounded, you know, because like, Okay, and she said, you know, it's an embarrassment to her, and she doesn't really know how to handle that. And I just keep hearing this more and more people believing in this. And so, sadly, we do have to talk about it and um, and get our story straight on this and why this is a problem. So, Danny, you've had some experience with this, I know, because he gets way more questions as the astronomer about it than I do. So what's been some of your experience with this? I had a similar experience about a year and a half ago. Uh, in a week's time, less less than a week, I had three conversations with different adults about uh, young people they knew they were concerned with. And, and that automatically just raised up all sorts of, okay, there's something going on. Right. And I had a tip off uh, a year or so before that. I'd gotten uh -huh. six months, 12 months apart, I'd gotten two emails from people linking me to this uh, one video, wasn't different videos actually, but a short video promoting Flat Earth. And I didn't really put it together. I thought, okay, that's interesting. I wonder what they're trying to do here. So uh -huh. it's really exploded in the last two or yeah. three years, big time. And I've uh, responded to it. I've written five articles on our website uh, over the past 13 months. And I've done one, uh, one of my personal blogs on it. That was uh, back a few months ago. Uh -huh. And uh, in the last year and a half, I've spent a lot of time looking into this. I've looked at unbelievable hours of videos. There are a lot of them out there, thousands, maybe millions of them. Right. And it gets repetitive after a while. I have read several of the things that are out there, read a couple of the books that are out there. I want to mention two people by name particularly. Uh, one is uh, Eric Dubay. Uh, I've got two of his books here. Uh, this first one is called The Flat Earth uh, Conspiracy. Um, this one... Uh, I, I still can't quite figure the bay out. I'm trying. To, well, that's what I was wondering. With a lot of these people that are promoting the idea of a flat Earth, like I mean, that are you know having books and things like this, are they serious about it? Like they really believe the Earth is flat, or are they just trying to do this to see how many people will actually, how many gullible people are out there? I think many of them are very sincere. I've seen many that are, are absolutely, I'm convinced, are sincere. The bay, I'm not sure. I go back and forth on either he's uh -huh. misled himself or he's intentionally, uh, you know punking people with this. Right, right. Uh, even the title of his book, The Flat Earth Conspiracy, if he really believes it's a big conspiracy promoting uh, the spherical Earth, then why isn't this called the spherical Earth, Earth conspiracy? conspiracy? I keep wondering if maybe just the title of the book even is a clue that, hey, folks, yeah. I'm really joking here. Uh -huh. i got to read the first line to you. I, I cracked me up when I read this, this mixed metaphor. It uh -huh. says, wolves in sheep's clothing have pulled the wolves over our, wool over our eyes. And I just, <laughs> again, is that just a clue telling us that? <laughs> that he's just playing around. This other book is a little briefer. It's uh, 200 Proofs uh, Earth is Not a Spinning Ball. And that's kind of, I think, meant as an update to a guy named Carpenter who wrote a book. It's 100 Proofs 130, 140 years mm -hmm. ago. And um, I don't know, maybe twice as good because they have 200 supposedly. Many of them are rep repetitious, however, so it mm -hmm. really isn't 200, even 100 in the original. The other one I'll mention is uh, Rob Skiba. He's, uh, by the way, DeBay doesn't claim to be a Christian. I think he's probably an atheist. Uh, but... Uh, uh, Skiba claims to be a Christian. He's uh, written a number of books, uh, spoken quite a bit. He's uh, into fantastic things, the Nephilim prophecy, and oh, I think this okay. is another one of these things. And uh, Skiba claims that he's that he's not really convinced necessarily. He's just uh, investigating it. But there comes yeah. a time to reach a conclusion, Rob, and and you haven't. And uh, you're also he's also featured as a one of the principal speakers at the first International Flat Earth Conference in North Carolina this November. So if you're really sitting on the fence, why are you out there promoting one side? I think his actions speak far louder than his words do. Do either of these guys have like degrees in any kind of scientific field by which they could effectively evaluate the answer to this question? No. Okay. I mean, that, that's, that's... That answers that uh, question. Okay, yeah, yeah, pretty simple. So total non-experts. And one of the things we were talking about earlier, I know, is that... 
um, a lot of times, you know, you've written quite a bit on this, but these, but a lot of these people that believe in flat earth only want to watch videos. Mm -hmm. Like they won't read the articles published against these ideas. And I think that's so common among our young people today and especially our young people. And well, they just see this wonderfully produced video on YouTube, which is a great source of authoritative information on any scientific yep. topic, as we all know. <laughs> um, and, and they just, they believe it. Well, it's produced well and, and these people seem to know what they're talking about. So it must be true. And I think even more, it tells us how discerning we need to be and teaching our children to be discerning and to really look carefully at these things and not just take someone's word for it, who isn't even an authority figure right. on this topic, um, talk about it, but really to research it and to look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, th I think I need to describe also what this entails. Their, their model is what they, some, some people call a snow globe earth. You've got a flat, round earth like this, and then you've got like a, 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 a dome yeah. around it, mm -hmm. a vault around it. And everything that happens is inside of all of this. It's like a snow globe, except there's no glitter inside from the snow. <laughs> all right? And uh, it's also geocentric. Obviously, if everything's contained inside of the sun, the moon, the stars, everything inside that vault, then the Earth is not moving, though it's different from classical geocentrism, which mm -hmm. we've had to deal with before. And there are no orbiting satellites. You don't have satellites going around the Earth like this. They're all well, Anything else is just moving up here. So consequently, if there are no satellites, uh, then we've not gone to the moon either. And if that's the case, then everything NASA's done for the past 60 years, they haven't done. Everything's fake and, and fooled. Of course, now you've got tens of thousands of people involved with this vast conspiracy, the point of which is not very clear. And um, this all leads then to very grand conspiracies. People, uh, right. with the people matri love conspiracies. Matrix movies, the whole thing. You know, people mm -hmm. like to think there's something else going on sure. than what's obvious. So that's, that's kind of an appeal there. And this swerves into what I've been calling recent years Christian Gnosticism. Mm, One of the yeah. elements of Gnosticism was a secret belief, secret knowledge, that if you became attuned to those, it leads to a higher spiritual plane. Well, it's kind of like a lot of what we deal with um, many times with the BioLogos organization that promotes theistic evolution. They kind of have that, well, you have to listen to me because I, I, can, I can actually read the Bible in its original language, and therefore I know more about these things than you do mm -hmm. you know like like the bible isn't plain and, and straightforward in what it's saying now, i'm not saying there's certain more things that can't be weeded out by that i'm not dismissing that but i'm saying it's almost like they said or if you don't know ancient near eastern culture you can't understand what the bible's talking about so it's like they have the secret knowledge that you have to listen to them to be able to understand things yep. better. And so we see it in a lot of places, I think. And I think it ultimately appeals to the pride. You know, yeah. I've, I've discovered something you haven't discovered. I know something you don't know. But if, mm -hmm. you, if you really study and learn like I have, you too can be initiated to that. And so pride will get you there. Unfortunately, uh, pride will keep you there because uh, I, I've studied this thing quite in depth. And it's really specious. It really is. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is it pulls people in because they deal with topics many people don't know a lot about. And so they're easily swayed if they don't have enough information. And so um, at some point, if you want to get out of this, you have to admit to yourself that you've been duped, you've been fooled. And that's damaging it's to the pride. Hard. It really is it's hard. It's hard so, to admit you're wrong. <laughs> so, so, so pride gets you there, and pride keeps you entrapped there. And, and that's really sad. Something, too, I should tell people, don't forget to send your little you know, emojis, because that gets this out there more. And we do want this to be helpful to people, which is why we're doing a sort of a two-part series on this. And the other thing, too, is if you have questions about this topic, one of the things that Dr. Faulkner and I were discussing was, go ahead and put those on there, and we'll kind of scroll through the comments afterwards and see some of the things that we might want to address on Thursday. Thursdays, um, mm -hmm. where we're going to talk, today we're kind of talking more about the history of how did this come about, like mm -hmm. what are the modern day proponents of it, and then talking about the science behind it, and some of the problems with the flat earth, well, a lot of problems with the flat earth science, if you want to call it that. And I divide the arguments up into six basic okay. fallacies are made. One is uh, false, uh, false information. There are some things out there I've encountered which I blatantly know not to be true. Uh, for instance, the... Um, one, one general last year was arguing that the North Star is visible well south of the Earth's equator. Well, mm -hmm. having made numerous trips to the Southern Hemisphere, viewed it from numerous continents and countries, mm -hmm. I can tell you, my knowledge of the stars that I've studied for a half century almost, it's not visible from most of the Southern Hemisphere, barely below the equator, but no deeper than that. That's just simply false information. If right. you read that out there, you, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, another one is uh, incomplete information. They will, they will give you some information that's correct, but they don't tell you everything that's involved with it. And, and once you get more information, you find, well, that 
kind of modifies what the first part that was. That kind of reminds me of, you know, a lot with evolution you'll see that, is people say, oh, well, this eye could have definitely evolved into this eye mm -hmm. over time. And as a geneticist, I'm looking at that going, yeah, but how many genetic changes would have to happen for that to occur? It might look easy when you see it in this nice little video, but the reality behind it is it would take so many genetic changes that just something like that wouldn't even be plausible. So yeah. when you get into the details sometimes, that's where it can fall apart. And a third problem is so sometimes they give you reasonably correct information that's uh, yet improperly interpreted. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched a video about a week, about a month ago, I guess. So this poor fellow had, had uh, was videoing uh, boats uh, off some distance, and the holes were disappeared. You, know, you couldn't see them because they're past the curvature of the earth. And yet he was arguing uh, that this was... Uh, quite in step with a flat earth, and he was arguing somehow waterways you couldn't see were blocking your view. It was crazy stuff, but he was he had the correct information right there, but he was improperly interpreting them. Mm -hmm. And a fourth, the fourth way is assertions. People simply assert things. I've encountered this mm -hmm. among the people who um, deny we've gone to the moon. I first encountered that a decade ago, and my, my approach there would point out that at least two of the 12 men who walked to the moon later came to the, came to the Lord in salvation. And you're accusing two Christian brothers yeah, of of, of why one of the biggest things that ever happened to them, right. and uh, their their response would stop them in their tracks typically, but not the flat earthers. The flat earthers just blithely go on. They just assert that all those astronauts are Freemasons, and that's part of the conspiracy. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Uh, whether they are Freemasons or not is a, is a debatable issue, perhaps, but. I, so I can't really. What does that have to do with? Well, it's yeah. part of the conspiracy, but they see they haven't right. proven that any of them are Freemasons. They just simply asserted that "quote unquote" all mm -hmm. of them are. So therefore, that proves it in the minds of many uh, people sucked in by this. That's that's successful argumentation, but it's merely an assertion. You're not even right. sh begin to show it's you true need to or read, not. Yeah, and then I, then reason that it's irrelevant. I had a question. Uh, so last night the moon was beautiful here, and it was mm -hmm. big and full looking. And I don't know if it was a full was it full moon yesterday or close to. Uh, full it was moon. the day after, I think. Okay, but okay. Close, so close. it looked very full. So one of the things I was thinking last night, because I knew this was coming up today, I was thinking, so what do flat earthers say about? like the moon and other celestial bodies because to me I look at that and I say it looks like a sphere to me but what did they what did they think about planets well, the, and the, moon? Yeah, the phase of the moon can only happen as we see them if they're if it's if the moon is spherical sphere, it's right. not only curved this way but also the third dimension mm -hmm. in our line of sight and it's being illuminated by the sun and it's very easy to explain if you as you as you take the moon around it goes from a crescent to a right. full and back around again but the um, the flat earthers assert that the moon is not a not a sphere. It's actually a disk. It has its own light. It doesn't reflect the light of the sun. It's uh, okay. it's somewhat transparent. You can see through it. Uh, all these things are just false assertions, and there's evidence quite contrary to what they what they argue on this, despite how 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 serious they seem about all this. Hmm. And it's flabbergasting to deal with this. And and the thing is, they just simply run ripshod over the the traditional explanation, the correct right. explanation for all these things. And they try to, you know, throw out little factoids here and there again, some false, some partially true, some of them improperly interpreted, mm -hmm. um, all the while throwing pot shots out there. But they never, and I do mean never, explain to you what the phase of the moon are. I mean, they just don't. They just tear down the, what the other ideas are, supposedly, but they don't offer anything You can't in the term. do that. And that's one of the no, things, no. even with the evolution and, you know, creation model is, it's important to tear down the evolution model and know that it's not true, but then build what the is bet. true? You build have to the build the creation model and be able to explain it from that perspective. So that's right. an important part of it. And that. I've counted that a lot. And then fifthly, I find unusual phenomenon passed off as being normal. They'll find some unusual effect that takes place, and then this is passed off, like uh, dealing with lunar eclipses. Maybe talk about that later on, maybe on Thursday. Uh, they, they assert that uh, uh, the, the, during a, uh, well, a solar eclipse, excuse me, Oh, excuse me, uh, back up. A uh, solar eclipse, uh, a lunar eclipse takes place, and they say that the sun and the moon have been in the sky at the same time. When I first read that, I thought it was like the sun's up here and the moon's up here. That's patently impossible. But then right. I got to thinking about it, I quickly realized, well, yeah, it is possible, but you have to catch the sun really low as it, as it rises or right. sets, and the moon uh -huh. really low, ri low as it rises. Right, yeah. Only for a minute or two can you, can you do that. Right. And so consequently... Uh, uh, it's an unusual sort of circumstances. It happens mm -hmm. every eclipse if the weather is really good and you're in the right location, everything. Mm -hmm. But that's hardly a common occurrence. Right. It's, and it is, it is mm -hmm. easy to explain in terms the of the, the, the yeah. umbra, the Earth's umbra is larger, uh, larger than the moon is. And so actually for a moment or two, it's possible to see mm -hmm. the moon and the sun and the sky at the same time during a lunar eclipse. It right. happens. Right. But that's, uh, that's just one of those uh, interpreted incorrectly. And then finally, uh, this is a biggie, and it's the most recent article I've put on our website, uh, a total mishandling of scripture. 
And that was a really interesting one. Oh. As I read through that, I was like, man, I can't believe how they're taking some of these verses just totally out of context. And, and, and twisting them around, and, and then they try to blithely uh, say that this is what the Bible clearly and you, teaches. And you can see all of the articles that we're referring to, um, we pinned all of uh, Dr. Faulkner's articles at the very top. So you'll see all of those. And we encourage you to read those, okay, and pass those on because this is, again, this is someone who's an authority on this particular topic talking about it and thinking about these things. Well, the, the history of this is interesting. Um, it really goes back to the 19th century. It doesn't go any back any It doesn't further. go back to Christopher Columbus. No, I doesn't. mean, I thought for sure he thought he was going to, I mean, everyone's heard that, right? That yeah. Christopher okay. Columbus thought he was going to sail off, you know, the end of the world. Well, Christopher and, Columbus thought he went, but everybody else thought he went. Right, yeah. And the idea we learned, we learned this growing up is right. that everybody thought the world was flat, and so if you sailed across the ocean, you hit the edge of the earth, or something like this. Yeah. And of course, Christopher Columbus said, since it's spherical, I can go from Spain over to Asia over here by going west like this, didn't uh -huh. know there was North and, and South around. America in between. Yeah. Now, if you turn it around, look here, it's very obvious that it's a lot shorter to go from from Spain to Asia by going east. It's a right. lot shorter. Right, yeah. And that was really the whole question back then. Um, people had known that the Earth was spherical for almost 2,000 years at the time of mm -hmm. Columbus, 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. The debate, I want to say this again, the debate 500 years ago at the time of Columbus was not over the shape of the earth, it was over the size of the earth. Mm. Guess what? Christopher Columbus was wrong. He lowballed and highballed figures and conspired to get it going shorter, going we westward from Spain to Asia. As you can see on any globe, that isn't going to work. That isn't going to work, yeah. Uh, he he, he, he lowballed and highballed the figures, cooked them to get there. His critics were actually right. Even think about it Columbus sails from Spain over to the uh, islands over here near the Caribbean. And it goes back to Spain. He does it three more times. How does that prove the Earth is spherical? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't even hold up the scrutiny yeah, there. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, I used to talk about this in my astronomy class. Uh, I'd say, I'd talk to people and say, well, how do you know the Earth is, is spherical? And uh, most of my students wouldn't, wouldn't have a clue. They'd say, well, space, space photos. Well, yeah, that's fine. It lasts 50 years. But what about, what about 2,500 sure. years ago, how they sure. do it? And the, uh, the early theory, uh, early study goes back to Pythagoras in the 6th century mm -hmm. B.C. Uh, he realized what caused lunar eclipses. It's a shadow of the Earth falling uh, on, the, uh, on the moon. And I have here a little round disk. We've got multiple lights up here, so I can't show it quite as well. But if I hold the thing up like this, you can see from those three lights there, I get three basically circular shapes. Right, he does. So, you won't be able to see it, but I can okay. see it. So and and so a, a round, flat object can actually cast round shadows uh -huh. as long as the sun is coming, the light's coming straight down and the, the screen's down here. That would right. happen to the lunar eclipse. If it's at midnight, mm -hmm. the sun's up here and the moon's down here, mm -hmm. or vice versa. What happens if it's sunrise or sunset? I turn it like that, and you get a, you're going to get, get a, a disc, a, a kind of a line a across line, there, yeah. a little ellipse. And so the sun's like this, the moon's down here. You're going to end up with not a circle at all. Right. Now I've seen more than a dozen the total lunar eclipses. I've seen many other total lunar eclipses. I mean, partial lunar eclipses, mm -hmm. and that shape is always a circle. And Pythagoras, 20, 2500, 6th century BC, over 2500 years ago, noted that the shape of the Earth's umbra was always a circle. And the only shape that always cast a circular shadow, regardless of orientation, is mm -hmm. a sphere. Is a sphere, yeah. Now, the, 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 by the way, the, the flat earthers have a good explanation for that. I'm sure they do. They <laughs> say that the, sh the uh, lunar eclipse is not caused by the Earth's shadow falling on the, on the moon. Okay, so what's it caused by? Uh, they don't know. They don't care. Apparently, they, they never offer an explanation. See, that's a problem. You can't you can't tear down one model yeah. without having another model to support what you Particularly, particularly when there's very good abundant evidence that this model actually does right. work very well. Just an assertion that it doesn't work, and off they go wow. again. And Eratosthenes, around 200 BC, measured the size of the Earth pretty accurately, and that mm -hmm. information was known to Columbus at the time that's of his neat. voyage. And that was information was important. It was used, quoted right. there. Yeah. Ptolemy wrote around 140 AD this book uh, now known to us as the Almagest, and it's a, a, a lot of people writing, Eric de Bay and others try to claim that uh, the ancient astronomers predicted eclipses in all planetary positions and such based on a flat Earth model. That's absolutely false. You can get English translations of Ptolemy's work, and it's mm -hmm. very clear in there that he was talking about a spherical Earth. Uh, no doubt about that. So I'm, when I read those kind of things, I think, well, what planet are they on? They certainly, <laughs> certainly don't know what they're talking about. 
And uh, this whole thing, that's one of the three points I can make about the 19th century. That, yeah, so that, like where where did this, I mean... Why did it come from? Because these people obviously right. believe the earth was round. Right. I mean, it's not something from the Bible that doesn't... There's nothing in the Bible that says the earth isn't, you know, a sphere. So where where is the debate? I mean, no. where did this even start? Uh, well, our faux history we have of, you know, everybody thinking the earth was flat until the time of Columbus really came from the 19th century, the latter part of the 19th century. There were two uh, very influential writers, Andrew Dixon White and John uh, William Draper, and they uh, invented what's called the conflict thesis. They were building on the post-Enlightenment world. The Enlightenment, I think, was a disaster in many respects. They, they hijacked uh, progress of science and, and, and it was actually a Christian foundation and then and, and made it into an atheistic enterprise from mm -hmm. there. And the, the conflict thesis is that there had been a long war between religion and progress, or science, and more specifically, it should be read as Christianity. And in both of their books, they, they had a long laundry list of how the uh, Christianity had held up progress in the mm -hmm. West. Uh, in reality, uh, a lot of it's bogus. Uh, one of their arguments was that uh, the church had taught that the earth is flat. And the church never, repeat, never uh, taught that. Uh, there was a man, a medieval scholar uh, back in 1991, his name was Jeffrey Burton Russell, wrote a very in uh, important book, I think, called Inventing the Flat Earth. He got tired of this thing being repeated over and over mm. and over again. So he wrote this, uh, this book, it's not very long, but it's very well written, easy to read, and well documented that uh, the, during the Middle Ages, almost nobody believed in a, in a flat earth. The, mm -hmm. Roman, the, the church at the time, the Roman Catholic Church for the most part during that time, they didn't teach flat earth. Right. They taught Ptolemy, they taught Aristotle, and both Ptolemy and Aristotle believed in a spherical earth. <laughs> so um, this all got totally changed in, in the past 130 years. Everybody's grown up thinking that people thought the earth was flat. Right. So if you come along uh, now and you have this uh, misunderstanding of history, then it's very easy to believe then, I guess, that uh, this whole thing about anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Christianity, and evolution, the foundation was really set when they overthrew the flat earth in terms of the spherical earth. Mm. But the history is completely bogus on that. I can't wow. be more emphatic about it. So that played a very important role. Now, a couple other things happened during that time. Uh, modern archaeology uh, began to develop in the 19th century, mm -hmm. and a lot of that archaeology was being done in the Middle East, and they uh, uncovered about what they call the ancient Near East, which is you mentioned uh, we've before. We've been very familiar with uh, A and E for short. And they unearthed uh, a cosmology of a flat uh, earth. So this is how the, ancient Near Eastern cultures uh, viewed, well, supposedly. Supposedly uh, viewed. The uh, flat earth, they encountered a, uh, an unearthed uh, in the archaeology, a flat domed earth, a snow globe, if you will. And this then became the ancient Near East cosmology. And that's what you see, and I've seen this a lot, Repeatedly. even though I don't know a lot about uh, this particular area, but I've seen Biologos use that a lot mm -hmm. to say, well, the Bible borrowed this, this is the this was the popular cosmology at the time, this is what they believed. And this is all ties in with the JEPD yeah, theory. Yeah, you see? Yeah, that's the third see. element coming mm -hmm. along in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the Bible, the Old Testament was uh, collated or uh, edited or put together in the late uh, late. First, first millennium BC, the exile, right? and they just simply amalgamated all these ideas. Well, first of all, that's a wrong theory, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I believe that <laughs> we have articles on our website far, talking about that far earlier than that. But more importantly, this idea of a flat domed cosmology being the A and E cosmology is totally bogus. Mm. As it turned out, ensuing archaeological discoveries unearthed many other cosmologies. There is no single A N E cosmology. cosmology. There are many different examples. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that that uh, that this is this is it is uh, is wrong. So anyway, you take the JEPD theory along with this bogus flat earth cosmology, the A N E and uh, the conflict thesis, you put it all together and you got a you got a really potent mix of people really ragging on Christianity and the Bible trying to discredit it. Well we see this all the I mean Biologos does this all the time. I've seen this so many times, them talking about, they'll even show pictures mm -hmm. of the cosmology and the dome, the snowball kind of thing that, Dan, that Dr. Faulkner was just talking about. And um, yeah, they assume that you basically have to understand the ancient Near Eastern cultures to be able to understand the Bible. Yeah. And that the Bible was adopting false scientific, the, the writers of the Bible were adopting false scientific ideas. And, and the JEPD, -J those are four initials for the the people that supposedly... Jehovah, uh, Elohim, uh, uh, Deuteronomic, and Priestly. Four different, four different right. groups of people. Four different ways. Yeah, so it's basically saying four different... 
Four different, four different uh, narratives they were saying were being were being come across in Genesis, particularly, and so the right. different parts reflect different uh, reflect different belief systems. Different belief systems. So it's not written by Moses. It's written by you know much later or something else. So like I say, we have articles that explain that in more detail. But and again, what's, here and what's it wrong ties, with it? What's yeah, wrong with here it? it ties in again with it. So the, so the liberals promulgated this, um, you know late 19th century, but conservatives even, even somewhere in the middle, that they weren't even embracing it. This whole idea of this showing up in more conservative sources a fairly recent development. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, the flat earth people, uh, they run to this liberal stuff, this liberal trash, and they say, well, this is the, they, they take these, these depictions uh, uh, of a flat dome, a flat earth with a dome over top. This is the biblical cosmology, and it's not. It's simply cr critics of the late nineteenth century imposing this upon the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so, when people try to claim the flat earthers try to claim that this is what the Bible teaches, they're they're filtering that entirely through skeptics and liberals and atheists, and that's just completely wrongheaded to right. do that. Yeah. Well, we're getting a lot of comments. Continue to send your little emojis and everything like that because that helps this get more reach out there and more people seeing this and we will be archiving this on our YouTube site because um, we want people to be able to share this because if the if the flat earthers are watching videos well here's another one for them to watch because we wanted to get that information out there and how this has started and I've I've been watching the comments a little bit and so we're definitely getting some interesting ones okay. on here <laughs> but if I may kind of kind of go ahead a little bit with with what we might talk about on on right. Thursday yeah uh, I, I, I did a little test back last last summer uh, to test this. You've got this domed earth sitting here, and the flat earth, you read their, their articles, they say that the sun and the moon are 32 miles in diameter, they're disks, and they're 3,000 uh, miles in elevation. So I went out on a on a last August. Yeah, that's Sorry. Their, that, 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 that's <laughs> My mind's trying to wrap itself. That's their model, and we can <laughs> test this model. Here's what I did. We're, we're right here. And let's say I look at, at, the, at the sun at local noon, which for us is about quarter to two because of daylight stupid time, I mean, saving time, and the fact that we're should be in the central time zone, we're actually Doesn't in, like in that the eastern. At all. I don't like that, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I go out around at local noon when the sun is as high up as it can get, and the date I picked was last early August, and uh, the angle of the sun made at local noon was like 62 degrees, I think, as I mm -hmm. recall. So I took a photograph of the thing. I used a Questar telescope we have. Here's a, a photograph I took, and you can see it's a... Uh, Big uh, yellow orange ball there. Uh, I'll tell you about the can. Tell a Questar. ball. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a Questar tel cute. yeah Questar telescope. It's got a twelve hundred millimeter focal length. I put my SL single lens reflex camera on it. I set the ISO at one hundred with the solar filter, of course, on the standard filter on the end of it. And I think it was one sixtieth of a second, I believe, or one hundredth. I can't remember, but I, I had a, I wrote the time down. I had uh -huh. it, and. Um, uh, but earlier in the day, I did the same thing. I, I set the telescope up and I and I captured the sun early in the morning. Okay. So if, if this is at noon, mm -hmm. early in the morning, it's going to be over here. It's lower in the sky. It's only about eight degrees up, and obviously, I'm closer to it here than I am over here right. because it's lower in the sky. It's lower it's, in the sky. Well, actually, it's, oh, here it's three thousand. Here's three thousand feet. So three thousand miles. So here I'm I'm closer. Over here it's fall. It must be when it's over here, low in the sky. Got to be eight degrees up. It's got to be really far away. It's a right. great distance here, and over here, it's uh, much much closer to me. Right. So I just simply used simple trigonometry, and I wrote this up in one of the articles we have mm -hmm. online, okay. and I calculated uh, what the size of the image should be and compared it to what it ought to be when it was when it was low in the sky, as high overhead. When it's high overhead, it was about six times closer to us mm -hmm. according to their model. So according to their model. So it ought to be six times larger to us. Period. Right. Six times larger, and. Um, because it's only 3,000 miles away. Now, if it's 93 million miles away, it doesn't matter because right. we're only a few thousand miles away. Right, but I'm saying in their model, model. the sun's very, so, very close. So the conventional understanding of how the world works is the sun will have the same size when it's high overhead or when it's down low in the sky. Because it's so far away from But us. with the flat earth model, it would be much, much smaller. Here's the image. Notice it's dimmer than the other one was. I can see some tree branches here. Same exposure time, same ISO, same telescope, same everything, except the sun is lower. It's redder, and it's also... Uh, Fainter because it's lower in the sky. Compare the two images. Does the top one look six times larger than the bottom one? Uh, no. Clearly, they're the same size. <laughs> this is a very straightforward, simple experiment. I took their model. I predict. I, I said, "Here's the prediction of their model." I did the test of the model, and the model ultimately failed. Now, the conventional understanding of 93 million miles away predicts they'll be the same size. Right. They are the same size. Mm -hmm. This simple 
experiment then demonstrates or it's consistent with the conventional model of the sun being 93 million miles away and it disproves the model of it being 3,000 miles up. So, and there are others I've done too like this. Okay, but if the, this, okay, I'm sorry. I'm having a, a really hard time with this flat earth model from the sense of if the sun's only 3,000 miles away, I mean, we'd all be toast. Well, it's, How it's, do they explain it's, it's, that? it's much smaller than, than we than normally Oh, that's right, because 30, it's only 32, 32 miles, miles across. across. So yes. it's, all, it's just really, really tiny. Yeah. And so, oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> like, if it's not enough that the Earth is flat, the sun is really tiny and only a few thousand miles away. So it just seems to, one thing leads to another. It yeah. kind of cascades, yeah. because if the Earth is flat, other things are different too in the solar system okay interesting i learned some new things today well um so thank you all for joining us and um we'll be back on thursday and dr faulkner is going to address some of the science some more of the scientific um aspects of this and why the earth cannot be flat and i know he was even showing me a video this morning of one of the people who believes in a, a flat earth and talking about this and he said look what they're saying is not what's appearing on the screen <laughs> and i'm like yes you're right I said, oh my gosh even i can see that and so um we'll be scrolling through some of your um comments and questions and and those that we those that are on topic i know some people kind of got on some other things but those that are on topic we'll try to address on thursday so we'll see back then. Hi and welcome back to Answers News. What is the day today? Is it the July 12th I think. Is it July 12th? Okay. I can remember that. It. <laughs> it's July 12th. I have to start our timer here so we know. There we go. All right so it's July 12th 2017 and um, so the other day on Monday we had a whole session on the flat earth and is the earth flat and you know it's funny one of the things people were saying was well why are you even having this discussion I mean everyone knows that the earth is round I said well you know I shared uh, a recent interaction I had with some people who didn't believe the earth was round and, and even as I was looking through some of the comments on our first answers news it said thank you we needed to hear this my daughter was just trying to have this discussion with a Christian friend and so this is very relevant I mean so um, don't chide us for, <laughs> for having this discussion because you know there are actually a lot of people that are questioning this and that's why we want to talk about it from both a biblical and a scientific perspective and give people some information so that they can use it um, when they when they talk to others about it so some of the fun, some of the funny comments though. Okay, so th these crack me up. On um, one, okay, if the world was flat, the cats would have pushed everything off of it by now. So that was funny. I like that one. Yeah. Having had cats in the past, I think that one was pretty funny. Um, and let's see, what was another one? Oh, sane people believe in a flat Earth. Inconceivable. So a little nod out to the Princess Bride there. Um, but those were some funny ones that we had. And I'll share some other ones as we go throughout um, our time here. But why don't you talk about a little bit about what we talked about last time and then kind of tell people what we're going to discuss today. Well, sure. We talked a little bit about the history of this idea of the flat earth. And contrary to popular misconception, it didn't arise from the ancient world. It actually arose in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And there also were three developments of the 19th century that I, I think had a, played a very important role in, in that idea coming about. And I also talked about some of the uh, things that are required to believe in, if you believe in a flat earth, geocentrism, vast conspiracy theories, and so mm -hmm. forth. And then I also talked about uh, six types of uh, different types of false arguments, you know, things that are improperly argued. And I think some of the examples I might give today would fall under one or more of those. Okay. And today I'd like to uh, <clears throat> now turn to some of the scriptural arguments that uh, okay. people try to use, try to refute those. Uh, these have been... Um, some people, one of the Facebook comments, you know, chided us for not doing that enough. Right. Actually, we got quite a few on that. Like, um, uh, let's see. Well, this man, meaning you, oh, is either clueless or lying. And what he <laughs> says does not fit with scripture. So we want to address the scripture aspect of that. Um, and, yeah, some other people said, well, prove that the earth is a spinning ball using the Bible, right. you know, so they, so we will address those things. You can't do everything in 30 minutes. So, and, and Dr. Faulkner has written a lot of articles on this topic and we've pinned those to the top of this so that you can see um, all those articles. Cause obviously even in an hour that we'll take this week, we can't get through all this information. So that will give you some more there too. And, and if you uh, forget how to do that, you can always go to the answers in Genesis.org mm -hmm. 
your mm -hmm. website and right. just type in Flat Earth and my articles will come up pretty quickly. Yep. There you go. So, okay. And I also hope to talk about physical evidences because those are those are discussed uh, out there. I want to try to <coughs> explain those, refute those. We don't have a whole lot of time to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get to the biblical arguments first. Right. Um, uh, I want to point out that uh, these arguments that people put forth today for the Flat Earth, supposedly from the Bible, don't come uh, historically positions of the church. The church never argued these points from Scripture. This all arose in the 19th century. And surprisingly enough, these arguments that flat earthers are using, supposedly from the Bible to support flat earth, are ones that are put forth from the skeptics and the atheists in the 19th century, mm -hmm. trying to, dis, uh, to uh, bring disrepute upon the Scripture, showing it's not authoritative. So I'm, just, I'm puzzled, and it breaks my heart at the same time, to see people parroting arguments that are 140, 150 right. years old. From people who are skeptics. An atheist. You know? <laughs> so you're, folks, you're using their arguments, not right. the church's arguments. Check right. the history on that, and you'll yeah. find out what I'm telling you is the truth here. And that's, uh, that's really bad. So they're resurrected from all those. So, uh, again, I have an article, the most recent article I have on our website on this from a couple of months ago was uh, on the biblical argument. It's kind of a lengthy argument. I'm not going to go in detail here. I'm just going to hit a few high spots. I suggest you go to the article for it's more really information. It's really good. I read through it and it was, I thought it was very informative. And, and one thing you got to keep in mind is that some people, uh, you know, they accuse us of believing everything in the Bible is literal. Well, we don't believe everything in the Bible is literal. There are many idioms. There are figures of speech. There are also imagery, particularly in the in the poetic and the uh, uh, prophetic passages. Right. In fact, right. most of the arguments are coming from those books where there is imagery and a simile and, and uh, metaphor. But, for instance, uh, Jesus said, I am the door. Well, did he have hinges? Did he have a, right. a latch on it? Did he have a handle? You know, <laughs> Of course not. We understand that it's not a literal door. So nobody really believes that the Bible is completely literal. One last thing, a lot of these are not really looked at in context. If you look at it in context, you'll see it means something very different. But anyway, uh, one put forth by some people, again, most flat earthers don't do that, is they talk about the three times that the four corners of the earth are mentioned, twice in Revelation, once in Isaiah. They say, see, on a, on a spherical earth, you cannot have uh, four corners. And that's true. However, every model of the flat earth I've ever seen out there is round and flat like this. Mm -hmm. There are no corners on this either. So it would argue against this, uh, oh, we taught the snow point. globe yeah. model the other day. Right. And uh, particularly I wanted to mention um, the one in Revelation 7.1. It also mentions the four angels standing at the uh, four winds and talking about the four corners. And the repetition of four there is, I think, very significant. The four winds generally refers to north, south, east, and west. Right. Today mm -hmm. we talk about winds coming from those directions or combinations of directions. So this is an idiomatic expression referring, referring to the four directions in space on the earth. Uh, well, and, it, the, you know, and we need to take the Bible as it's written. I mean, not mm -hmm. everything literally. No one, no one believes I don't that. know anyone that does that. I mean, but you take it as it's written. So history is history. Poetry is poetry. You know, prophecy is prophecy. And that, that's important to remember. And not to take it out of context. That's it. You have to take the surrounding verses around it as well. And the, uh, the another idiomatic expression is the ends of the earth recurs 28 mm -hmm. times. They say, well, you can't, you, you, uh, you can't have ends of the earth right. on, on a spherical round. earth. Mm -hmm. But that's not the point. The, in those cases, referring to the most uh, remote, remotest parts of the inhabited earth, I suggest Psalm 67, 7, 98, 3, and Isaiah 45, 22 are examples of those. And again, go to my article and look at that. Uh, one of the, I think one of the most bizarre ones <laughs> that are given is uh, Daniel 4, 11, and 20. It, there it's, uh, if they quote that with those two verses, or either one of those verses, you have a tree here that grows a tremendous height, and it's, the tree is so tall, it's visible from everywhere on the earth. And, of course, on a spherical earth, that's not possible, but on a flat earth it is. So, therefore, Daniel is teaching that the earth is flat. Uh, well, okay, folks, read the entire chapter. Right. You, you'll see that it's an account of one of the dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar. This tree that was so tall to be seen from all the earth was in a dream. <laughs> Nothing in a dream is real. Uh, furthermore, well, we don't even know if that if that uh, correctly reflected the cosmology of Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe it did. Maybe it did. Right. Doesn't really matter. It's a Keep symbol him, of something. Symbol of something. Because yeah. actually, in verse um, in verses twenty and twenty two, Daniel giving the uh, interpretation of the dream. 
says that Nebuchadnezzar is the tree. It doesn't say he's like the tree. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that tree, which, by the way, did I mention is in a dream? Mm -hmm. So it's a non, it's, it's a representation of something that's not even real. It's not literal in this case. So if you read the whole chapter, you would never come away saying, well, this means, proves the earth is flat. It just, it's not possible to think that in a rational world, I don't believe. Well, someone had asked, and this kind of goes along with the whole idea of that tree thing. It says, if the earth is flat, how come you can't see China with a telescope while standing on top of the Chrysler building? Well, if the earth is flat and it's clear, you should be able to do that if the earth is flat. It, and if the sky is clear enough, and right. later on, some physical evidence, they'll right. talk about that. Right. But yeah, that would be, if earth is flat and you've got any kind of tall, tall thing here, you mm -hmm. should be able to see it. Right. But this is a dream, people. This is a dream. Not reality. Now, a little better is in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. You have the temptation of Jesus, and one of the temptations he's taken up to us is a high mountain, and he sees all the kingdoms of the world. And they say, aha, on a, only from a flat earth could you see, you see all everything. the kingdoms of the world from a tall mountain mountain. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Where is that mountain? Right. Does it not exist anymore? What happened to it? You know, if it's there, we ought to be able to see it or we, we can go to it. Um, I don't think that mountain really exists in that situation. Furthermore, they avoid the parallel passage of Luke 4 uh, verses 1 through 13 mm -hmm. because it doesn't say mountain. It says a high place. In fact, the terminology used there, read my article if you want to read more about that, uh, suggests that instead of being a literal mountain and being shown literally all the kingdoms, it's talking about all the kingdoms throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. And it's a vision sort of thing that's being offered to Jesus there, not a literal mountain and not a literal view from such a literal mountain. Uh, one of the biggies out there you see frequently is the firmament, or I prefer to use the Hebrew word rakia. The word only appears 17 times. And over the last two years, I've written extensively on this. Uh, a chapter in a book I published last year, also an article I published last year on our Answers Research Journal. And, and I just had someone ask me about that the other day, like, well, what exactly is the firmament, like on day <laughs> two? And I'm like, we've got some great articles on our website that talk about that, because it's not necessarily an easy... Um, thing to to yeah. answer, and so you and really have to look at that. And the firmament is a result of a lot of bad translations going back to Septuagint in like the third century BC. They translated the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek, and they uh, translated it uh, stereoma, which is this uh, solid structure in which the stars were affixed. We call it the celestial sphere today, though I don't think it's a real sphere. It's, it's mm -hmm. the model we use. But the point is, it's not a vaulted dome. It's a complete sphere going around. Mm. I figure what people have done, when they, when I've, and I've had people throw these verses up to me. I see them on numerous sites out there saying the firmament, that has to be a dome. No, it isn't. If you look at the history of it and what the language is, as I have, you'll find out that uh, that's not what it means at all. And consequently, people that want to interpret it that way, what they do is they interpret the firmament when they read that in the King James in terms of a domed or vault over the earth. Mm -hmm. And then they turn around and use that as proof that the Bible is flat earth. Well, you've just <laughs> interpreted the scripture in terms of the what model you want, and then you try yeah. to use that to turn around and, yeah. and prove your model. Yeah. And that's circular reasoning. Uh, it really is. So it's, that's not what it says at all. I am thoroughly convinced. Here's another one from uh, 1 Samuel 2.8. It talks about the earth resting on pillars. And you'll get some people out there. Again, these diagrams were done by the skeptics in the late 19th, early mm -hmm. 20th century. You've got this flat earth, a dome, and pillars underneath. And they say, this is the biblical cosmology. Folks, these diagrams were done originally by liberals, by atheists, by mm -hmm. agnostics trying to discredit scripture. Furthermore, if the earth is resting on pillars, that doesn't square very well with Job 26.7, which says God yeah, hangs the earth nothing. upon nothing. <laughs> well, which is it? Does it not have anything supporting it or does it have pillars supporting it? Furthermore, we're told elsewhere in the New Testament that uh, good men, including uh, especially the, the leaders of the church, are pillars. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say they're like pillars. It says they are pillars. I've not seen a deacon or elder yet that was made out of limestone or something. You know, <laughs> It's obviously uh, a symbolic user there. Mm -hmm. And finally, one last one I'll mention. And this is uh, intersects with the uh, with the geocentrist and, and a person who is a flat earther is also a geocentrist, but the other the reverse is not necessarily true. And they uh, argue from several passages, such as First Chronicles sixteen thirty, Psalm ninety three one and ninety six ten, that the earth is said to be immovable. So if it's immovable, it just sits here. It doesn't move at all. And, of course, if the Earth is spinning and orbiting around the sun, it's moving. And so, consequently, that is contrary uh, to Scripture. Well, wait a minute. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the Apostle Paul exhorts us to be steadfast, immovable. Mm -hmm. 
So folks, unless you're still laying in bed from when you got up this morning or didn't get up, you just woke up this morning, then you have violated God's clearly stated intention for your life to be immovable. Clearly that immovable that Paul talked about uh, was not talking about geographically sitting still. Right. It's talking about not being moved from our faith and our, and our practice mm -hmm. and our belief. But also consider that's also New Testament. I understand, but look at this, Psalm 16, 8, the same word that used to describe the immovable earth, David refers to himself because God is his right hand. I will be immovable, he says. Mm -hmm. So obviously David never moved. He sat still. Well, that's clearly not the case either. So it turns out the meaning of that Hebrew word is not to vary from your prepared course. Course implies emotion. Right. So is the earth immovable in that sense? Yes, it doesn't veer from the course it's, it's moving on. It's not chaotic. It's not random. It has a st stayed course that God has ordained for it. That is the reality of the situation on these things. It's not a, uh, the, I, I go through these passages and I just have to kind of chuckle, roll my eyes that people are taking these many times out of context, not reading them in context is even more important, and then uh, being hyper-literal about this and uh, not realizing just what these words actually mean. Well, there's some people, and again, like we said before, some people are like, oh, I can't believe you guys are talking about this. You know, you should just go, eh, you know, those people, why would we believe that? But again, like we said over and over again, the reason that we're having to talk about it is because more and more people are actually believing it, um, and including Christian brother, you know, people mm -hmm. that are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that's why we feel like, no, we're not going to talk about it all the time, but we wanted to do something like this and have it recorded so that, um, the people that are coming up to us and talking to us about it, we can refer them to that and we can have good resources out there for people because, well, in some ways you might think, well, that's just totally unbelievable. That's inconceivable. Who would believe in a flat earth? But just like many other things, I could look at evolution and say, why would anyone want to believe that? Evidence totally goes against that. The Bible goes against that, yet people believe it. So it's one of those other things that we, we need to talk about and address so that we can hopefully lead people to the truth. And, and, if, and if you think this is just not relevant to you, then just uh, change the channel. Oh, there's plenty of stuff to watch on, on, on the Internet out there. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, All right, okay. well, let's move on to some of the physical evidences. And I, and I, you know, one person wrote in and said we didn't talk about any evidence. And I, I disagree completely. Uh, two things I talked about. One is I talked about the predictions we made. I won't right. go over this again, but I took these two photos last August. Uh, one in the afternoon when the sun was as high as it's going to get for the day. One very low in the day. And I, I used the flat Earth model that I'm not. I'm not taking it out of context or warping it or, or misrepresenting it. I took their model. I did the numbers, and I found out that when I took this photograph, the sun should have been about six times larger than, than this one. You can see clearly they're the same size because the sun isn't 32 miles in diameter and 3,000 miles up. It's 93 million miles away and quite a bit larger than the Earth. And that's... Um, Something you could do for yourself. Now, you need to have some proper filters and such, and I, I want to caution you to be very careful about <laughs> no. that. But you can buy these filters. You can get a camera on a tripod and try it yourself, but please be safe about it. The other thing I mentioned, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and this is, and the whole evidence thing is really important to talk about because one of the people that wrote in said this says, I don't know what the Earth is actually like, but I do not believe NASA's first moon landing. And if they lie about that, who knows what else they lie about? These people on the video, meaning us, are the same people who tell you to question science when it comes to evolution. Yet they laugh you into ridicule when you question the same science's view on the space. Now, when I read that, I thought, uh-uh-uh. There's a very important distinction here. The science that we're talking about right now and here is observational science. Just like Dr. Faulkner said, he took his telescope, he went out, he took pictures of the sun. Okay, That's very different from the science of evolution, which deals with things that have happened in the past that are not directly observable. And we talk about that all the time. And it's so important to make that distinction between what is observable um, and, testable. And, and, and in testable. the present and tangible versus what is not observable and has happened in the past and by which we have to rely on some authority for helping us know what that is. So that's the difference and yep. we need to we need to help very, people very know. Good point. Very, very different. Be a Berean about, about this. Go out and actually test it yourself. I see people out there all the time saying, research it, research it, research it. Well, folks, to be quite blunt about it, sitting in front of a bunch of YouTube videos is not research. Mm -hmm. That's entertainment, maybe a beginning of something, but you need to get out and, and test a few other right. things. Right. At the very beginning last time, I did talk about the uh, about lunar eclipses. Here's a photograph we took here at the uh, Creation Museum 
of Eclipse uh, two, three, I can't remember exactly, two or three years ago. And you can see the... Uh, a little higher. A little higher, okay. There you go. <laughs> and you can see there's a moon here, and then there's a, there's a circular cut out of it. The shape of the uh, Earth's uh, shadow is, is a circle. And see, a lunar eclipse can only happen when the, uh, the moon is full. And when the moon is full, you've got the sun over here, the Earth in the middle. Hold the Earth there, please. Okay. Okay, the sun is here, and the moon is here. It casts a shadow over here and hits the moon. You can't get an eclipse when the moon is here or over here, only when it's here, when the sun is over there. Only time it can happen. In fact, it doesn't happen every full moon because the moon's orbit is tilted about five degrees, and so sometimes it passes a little below where it needs to be and a little above, so the shadow of the Earth misses the moon mm -hmm. entirely. Mm -hmm. And people figured this out more than 2,000 years ago. They actually, actually could predict these eclipses uh, to some degree of accuracy, not real good, but some degree, uh, over 2,000 years ago, based upon the fact that they knew what caused an eclipse, a uh, lunar eclipse, and, and the flat earthers simply respond, well, uh, an eclipse is not caused by the Earth's shadow falling on the moon. Well, what is it? Well, they don't That's know, and they don't care, <laughs> but that isn't it. Folks, it's pretty clear. I would suggest, again, get off the YouTube, go outside, spend several months, every clear night, uh, go out and look at the moon, examine it, draw what it looks like, uh, think about where the sun is. It's pretty clear after a while the moon is reflecting the sun's light, and the phases it has can only happen if that's the case. And we know when it's full, it's opposite the sun. Ergo, that's what an eclipse is. You can test this. You can test this right. yourself. And that's one of the things that we've been talking about, too, is it's so important to, um, again, not disbelieve what you see on the Internet. It's not necessarily true just because it's on the Internet. And to really research these things, it is observable evidence um, that the Earth is not flat. So, yeah. Now, you mentioned about seeing uh, China from the Chrysler Building. This is one of the right, biggies yeah. out there. If the Earth is spherical like this, then if you look off in the distance, things over here off the edge of the Earth mm -hmm. are going to be beyond the curvature. Mm -hmm. And you can calculate this. The, uh, the It's eight inches at a mile, and for every mile beyond that, it's square the distance. So when mm -hmm. you go out uh, three miles, it's a matter of six feet. So if you if you stand with your eyes six feet above the water, which you put your eyeballs for an adult right 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 above mm -hmm. the, where, the, where the water's hitting the surf there, hitting the, the beach, the horizon is only three miles out. Mm -hmm. Now, anything beyond that is going to move off beyond that, and, and holes of ships will disappear mm -hmm. first. In fact, that was pointed out by people in ancient times. Mm -hmm. uh, our, uh, Aristotle, for instance, wrote about this. Because hmm. you see, folks, Aristotle knew the Earth was spherical, and he knew about this. Before they had any kind of pictures from outer space, or mm -hmm. anyone who went around the globe, or anything like that. Now, the modern the Flat Earth Movement got started in the 19th century by a man named Samuel Robottom. He did a, I love that name, by the way, Robottom, because <laughs> it's very re <laughs> relevant. Well. He went to the Bedford uh, Bedford level in uh, in England. It's about a six-mile stretch where there's a canal and river that's just flat as can be because it's, there's no gradient in the water, there's no current. Mm -hmm. And uh, he noticed if you got it, uh, there's a, if you take a, a small boat and row it away, row bottom across the bottom mm -hmm. there, uh, the six foot mast after three miles would disappear. And so he put a telescope down eight inches above the water and he watched through that as somebody rowed away and he could see the, the boat the entire way, the mast the whole way. And he said, aha, after six miles, five or six miles, I shouldn't see the mast, but I do, so therefore the earth must be flat. Okay. Well, later on, other people did the experiment uh, by other means. And by the way, here's a, here's a great photo. This is a very famous photo uh, reproduced here. A guy named um, uh, Joshua Nowicki did this. I, I, I think he's quite, a, quite an impressive photographer. And he took this from across Lake Michigan at a state park, done this a number of times, um, of the Chicago skyline. And it's like 56, 60 miles away. Mm -hmm. And if you do the calculation, the skyline of Chicago should be uh, you know, quite a bit below the horizon. You shouldn't see any of this. So they say, see, see, here's proof that the Earth is flat because this is not possible on a, on a spherical Earth. And that, that, to most people, is, is pretty, pretty good evidence. The problem is, uh, number one, this is not a common occurrence. It's pretty rare, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're passing it off as a common, common thing, which is one of the things I said, one of the errors that they right. make on this. And the problem is, is they have what's called a temperature inversion. I think everyone is familiar with the idea that a ground level uh, temperature, air, air temperature is usually warmer, and as you ex uh, grow, increase elevation, the temperature drops. Mm -hmm. That's the usual situation, particularly on land during the daytime. However, there are circumstances where you can end up with a layer of cool air right there with warmer air above, and then the temperature decreases again. That's called an inversion. And over water, particularly in the spring and summer, that is extremely common. 
on Lake Michigan from probably April through uh, August. It's September probably. It's mm -hmm. pretty on warm days. You're going to have a temperature inversion every day because the water temperature that part of Lake Michigan is maybe 68, 70 max mm -hmm. Fahrenheit, and the air temperature is usually warmer than that during right, those times. Sure. And um, the the speed of light is different in uh, air depending on the temperature. And so if you get this thin layer, uh, layer of several feet, perhaps, of cool air there, then uh, light coming along actually can't escape and, and get to the higher, uh, higher above that. And so it bends on around the edge of the earth and can do it from considerable distances. Hmm. And so this is uh, actually what's called an, um, a superior mirage. They don't like to hear us say that, but that's exactly what it is. <laughs> this light is going around the edge of the earth. The reason why it's called a superior mirage is because it appears higher than the object you're actually seeing. Now, most most people are familiar with an inferior mirage, so that happens when you've got a pocket of warm air next to the ground, warmer than the air right above it, quite mm -hmm. a bit warmer. This happens on sunny days, on deserts and on highways and mm -hmm. so forth. And what right. you're seeing is light's coming down from the sky, reflects off of that and comes off. You see the air, the light can't penetrate into that cooler air below, is the um, warmer air below, excuse me, because it's in cooler air above. And we take that for granted. Well, you can flip it over. The same thing happens when you get this, um, this inferior, uh, superior mirage. But the one difference is the fact that inferior mirages generally are inverted. Superior mirages are not, partly because this thing continually bends instead of being reflected a single time. Physics 101. Yes. Okay. Now we know why yes. physics is important. I'm not a physics person, but um, yeah. And so one of my articles good. is called just. There's people that can explain. One of my articles is called just a mirage. A subtitle. Right, you went into I go a lot into all this. And I'll show some of the photos that. from this. Last November, I went to Virginia Beach. I, I don't live there. I live here in the Midwest, Kentucky. Um, but I was over visiting, and it happened to be after a cool front had moved through. And the, I went out to the beach uh, one afternoon, mid afternoon. It was about 50, 50 degrees Fahrenheit when I started. Mm -hmm. Temperature dropped from there. But I looked it up. The water temperature was in the 60s oh, still. Wow. Mm -hmm. Classic situation where there was no temperature inversion. The air, if anything, the air next to the water was quite a bit warmer than the air above it, and then it, uh, uh, then it uh, decreased above that. So it even has the possibility of an inferior mirage. So I took this first photograph when I got there. There's a container ship taking off, uh, out, heading out to sea from, uh, from the port there at uh, Hampton Roads. And uh, you can see, of course, I think about eight uh, containers there on the container ship. And you got the name of the line there. It's the NYK line. And uh, yeah, NYK, it's a, it's a, I looked it up. It's a, a well known uh, shipping firm mm -hmm. based in Japan. You've probably seen some of those ships if you go to ports at all. And what's interesting is the, is the, the lettering is cut off. And on their ships, their lettering goes all the way down. It uh, doesn't go all the way down to the water line. It stops well before that. So already you can see part of the hull is dis disappeared. Right. You it's can't okay. see the hull. Now notice here's the, here's the uh, bridge castle and here's the uh, forecastle. We can't see it on here, the forecastle. You've got different multicolored uh, uh, containers. There's also a gray tier here. I'm not sure what that is. They look like containers, but I don't think they are. They're same shape and size, but they're all uniform color. Keep your eye on that. Uh, I, t I waited a little while and took another photograph. The ship is smaller. By the way, I took these all with the same Questar telescope. I did have to change the exposure times and the ISO settings to, for better resolution. And also, as light levels dropped, the thing got farther away. It got later in the afternoon, so they're not the same conditions on the ISO and setting, but everything else is the same. Focal length the same. Notice you can't see the lettering anymore. Mm -hmm. What happened to it? Well, it's beyond the curvature of the Earth, but I am mm -hmm. starting to see a, a, an inferior mirage. That gray tear is starting to show up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very nicely there uh -huh. on yeah, that thing. See it, yeah. I'm seeing an, 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 inf uh, an, an inferior mirage like yeah. you'd see over a desert. I expected to see that, but I'm not seeing much of the hull anymore. A little later on, I'm not seeing the hull oh, at no. all. Instead, I am seeing a mirrored image of that oh, yeah. uh, gray. And I'm also seeing some of the containers starting to show up uh -huh. on this thing. And as the ship goes further out, it starts to turn a little bit. And now I don't even see the gray line. I'm seeing mirrored down here. I'm starting to see the bridge castle being, uh, being mirrored very nicely. The ship turned, and now I'm seeing the stern. I wanted you to see this before the next photograph. Uh, I don't see any of the hull, of course. And I see nothing but the bridge castle showing up. And as the ship went farther away, uh, even the containers disappeared. And all that's left is the... Mm. Bridge Castle, and even it is uh, got an inferior mirage. You can see it yeah, reflected yeah. across the middle right there, That's and it's cool. kind of floating. Actually, the horizon is up here, 
but you don't see it because the inferior mirage of the sky huh. beyond is actually w wow. walking all over. It's lighter colored, That's so cool. it blots it out. So um, it's brown, people. <laughs> yeah. So so what I did is I intentionally took these photographs at a time when there clearly was no uh, temperature inversion. And on that, I, I've clearly showed that the hull disappears more and more right, of the ship. Yeah. By the time it got done, I, I think I estimated about 15 miles out or more that the ship mm -hmm. was. So hulls of ships do disappear first and then up, up, and up if, if you have... Uh, if you don't have a temperature inversion, many of these mm. things you see on YouTube out there, they're all with temperature inversions very clearly. I can even see that pretty nicely. Uh, finally, I want to share this. Uh, I went up to Door Peninsula, Door County in Wisconsin. It forms the boundary between Green Bay and Lake Michigan several years ago. And one morning, my son and I went out to the beach. And uh, I was told it's 18 miles or so over to, to the UP of Michigan. We stood mm -hmm. at the beach, mm -hmm. the rocky beach, and we could, all we could see was water. Could not see anything beyond there. Uh -huh. But then we drove around and drove up on some bluffs quite a bit higher above mm -hmm. that beach. And I could see the this tree is, line completely. Uh -huh. If, if the world were flat, I should have been able to see the tree line right. from the shore, but uh, I couldn't. If the earth is spherical, once I get up high enough, I can see it, which is exactly what happened. So I've got two evidences here, uh, things I've actually proved to myself, proved to my son. And mm -hmm. I hope to go back to, I've got an invite to go back to Door County sometime soon. Oh, I want good. to do that again and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and repeat that experiment. Now, somebody said there's a building in Dubai that if you stand at the top, you can actually see the curvature of the earth. I don't know. I'm skeptical. I've tried from planes looking out, and I've done the calculations from, uh -huh. say, 35,000 feet. Uh, the curvature uh, over, like, nearly 180 degrees is going to mount to about a degree. Those windows are too small. Maybe from that thing you can, but I'm, I'm skeptical. You have to get up pretty high to see yeah, the curvature. Yeah, I would think you would. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Someone had written um, in the other comments, and I, I've, I've read this one to you. We just... You just kind of think, what? It says, stand at the beach. Okay, the water will return to you on the beach. Should be going over a curve, but it doesn't go over any curve because, like Santa Claus, it isn't real. I don't understand that. <laughs> I, 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 so, the water is just not going to magic. So, in other words, I guess if the earth waves is, or tides, I'm not talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I guess it wouldn't return to you if somehow it's a curve. But that doesn't make any sense because of tides and all of that. So, anyways, yeah. So we we actually were kind of disappointed that we didn't have more, um, you know, evidences from those that believe in a flat Earth. There wasn't actually a lot of really, I mean, good hardcore or, evidences. Or responses to, to what, what I put up the other day. Yeah, not, or responses. Not, not, like, well, what's that, wrong with what he showed? And so, um, so anyways, I thought that was, we both thought that was kind of interesting, too. But... Um, but hopefully this gives you a lot of information on um, this particular topic, and we're archiving these on YouTube, uh, the Answers in Genesis YouTube channel. So when you have someone that's asking you questions about that on Facebook, because that's where we, you know, the debates of the world are settled. Um, so uh, you can link to this and hopefully help people get some more information. And like I said, Dr. Faulkner has quite a few articles that he's written on this, and it's not something that we can just go, eh, you know, we have to address it, we have to talk about it it because there are um, people believing it and um, we want people to know the truth from both a biblical perspective certainly and the scientific evidence also confirms what we already know to be true from God's word so so thanks um, Danny for being here with thanks us for and me. for going through all of these issues because I'm not a physicist or an astronomer or any of those things so that makes it really clear to me and and uh, and uh, Bodie will be back next week so um, Bodie and I will be here back with the news on Monday and Thursday so we'll see you then thanks